Just about 50 miles south of San Francisco's Golden Gate is an area that many of the nation's largest computer companies call home. Computer technology, hardware, software, chips, and microprocessors, they grow as fast as apricots did years ago. Now you won't see the term on a map, but natives call this the Silicon Valley. And as if the medfly wasn't enough, this once sleepy, peaceful place has been attacked from the farthest reaches of time and space. An onslaught that's threatening to take over the valley, the nation, and perhaps even the world. You know, there's only one way to beat these guys. With a pocket full of these. the invading force. No one can stop us, not even you. Well, when you play the machine and you defeat it, you know, you get this feeling that's just, you, that, I don't know, there's not many feelings like it when you defeat a machine. You've got that constant challenge. It's man against machine, a thinking machine. It's a real sense of accomplishment. It's just a good feeling to know that you're good at something. Yeah, I'm hooked on, you might say that. Well, I play about 20 hours a day, actually. Uh, that, that's on a short day. Sometimes it's about 30 hours. We divvy up the money equally, and then uh, we all just play until the coins are all gone. Honestly, if I could change the games in any way I possibly could, the thing that I'd most like to design in the games is a uh, direct line from the coin chute into my pocket. Go! I'm Bob Wilkins and we're just about ready to take a journey to a very fantastic world. A world where you can push a button or swivel a stick and actually conquer the limits of time and reality. For you see, we're just about ready to travel into the valley of the space invaders. city of Sunnyvale in the mythical county of Silicon Valley is the hub of the multi-billion dollar computer industry. International computer companies, silicone chips, microprocessors, robots, beeps, buttons, and readouts are as common here as shopping malls and stop signs. And although this is a very serious business, in 1972 these computers learned to play. The video game industry was launched by Nolan Bushnell, a brilliant computer engineer with a passion for games. His first game was this one, called Computer Space. It sold 2,000 units and proved that there was a market out there for video games. And so, with his next game, Pong, he started a company called Atari. He named it after a complicated Japanese game called Go. Among Atari's first employees in the early days was Lyle Raines. Back in the early days of Atari, the, the industry was really young. Uh, Atari was young. The average age was probably around 20 years old, maybe not that high. I don't know. It's very young. Uh, the atmosphere was loose, I guess you could term it. Uh, almost anything was an excuse for a party. Unit number 1,000 was an excuse for a party, but so was 1,005 if the mood struck you. Uh, lots of Friday afternoons out on the loading dock with uh, cakes of beer and bottles of wine and uh, just having a good time, basically. <coughs> the first project I ever worked on with Atari a long time ago was in a game called Tanks. And it was a two-player tank game, little bug tanks fought each other on a screen. Back then, the electronics did everything. There was no programming or software, per se. There was just circuits. There was a circuit to do this tank, a circuit to do that tank, a circuit to do their shells, a circuit to do the play field, a circuit for every little function you wanted to do. Asteroids, the microprocessor, uh, controlled game. It's programmed, 
It has some general purpose hardware or electronics that can do a variety of games. And Asteroids is one of the ones that was programmed to play. It's more like a true computer. Since 1974, when Warner Brothers bought Atari, these changes in technology have made new games easier and faster to produce. In 1980, Atari alone grossed one-third of Warner's total operating income. And it's expected that sales of video games for 1981 will go as high as $710 million. This is a little baby that made it all possible. It's a computer chip. As you can see, it's smaller than a domino. But this chip carries all the circuitry that's laid out here on this board. Now, there may be only one chip to a game, in most home games, for example, or as many as nine chips in a board as complex as this one for Atari's hit game, Centipede. Centipede, hey, that's me. But it still takes human imagination to program these games. And with the extremely high rate of turnover in game popularity, the need for new and exciting games is endless. And no one knows this better than Vice President of Marketing, Frank Ballou. Hey, this is Tempest. You're controlling the yellow segment at the top with what we call a whirly gig. And you're trying to destroy the objects before they destroy you. This red coming up, it's shooting at me. I get there and fire. I'm now being transported into the second level. There are 99 various levels in this game. So the player's skill and challenge will be ever increasing. Well, as far as Tempest, uh, when we start to develop the game, it's look nothing as you currently see it today. It's just the interaction, okay, the interplay, the exchange of ideas between marketing, the players, engineering, and various other people just to hopefully come up with a product that is a broad sense of appeal. We don't want to limit it and just only appeal to the skillful player. We want to be able to appeal to the unskillful player, the novice player, along with the professional player, if you want to say, the one who's been playing video games for the last eight years. We want to appeal to the lady or the gentleman that just started to play last week that put their first quarter into a game. Creating a game involves most of Atari's 3,000 employees, and it takes about a year and a half. It begins with a brainstorming session that reduces as many as 100 ideas to the top 25. Then, working teams of engineers, managers, and marketing experts take over and turn these ideas into reality. Dave Steuben is Atari's director of electrical engineering. Well, it's a lot of work, and to mm -hmm. some extent it's magic. Uh -huh. um, we come up with a game description, and we can implement certain aspects or images on the screen. But the real challenge is going from that point to the point where someone can really have fun playing the game. And that's very difficult to describe how to make a person have fun. We are um, stuck when we're designing video games between two poles, that which is outrageous, which is fun, it's novel, it's new and exciting, and that which is practical, something we can sell at a profit. The whole business is to have a lot of fun making something that you can make money at. If you're not making money, then you haven't done the whole job. Atari produces about eight to 10 different games a year for their coin-operated market. As soon as a new design has final approval, the manufacturing begins. exceptions, like asteroids and space invaders, the popular life of a video game is only four to six months. Then it's off to the video game retirement home. But here at Atari's employee game room, 
you can test out the very latest and still play the old favorites. I think the people at Atari have a different type of personality. Uh, fun, games come very natural. Uh, we all enjoy working very hard, but we enjoy playing very hard also, which uh, goes to show in some of our product. As far as the appeal of the games to myself, I guess it's the challenge. And it's a fascination. It really is. It's just like the players, I guess. It somewhat massages my ego. I think the players out in the field today are playing the games for a variety of reasons. I think that some of them want to escape from what's around them. Some of them are playing the games while they are socializing. It's part of their social activities. They go to some place to meet friends. They're socializing with the friends. And the game is a fun way of passing that social time. In a moment, we'll visit some of the arcades where well, people all over the country are pumping over $3 billion worth of quarters into video games like Asteroids and Centipede and Pac-Man and, well, even the old, ever-popular Space Invaders. It'll be on our list, too. $3 billion? And I'm the one getting shot at? I need a raise. Quarters. Definitely the biggest game in town. And you know, for just two bits, well, you can have a couple of moments of fantasy where you take on an enemy that's, well, maybe unstoppable, unbeatable. But I'll tell you one thing, he'll never tell you to stop, and he'll never tell you to go home. Every day in arcades like this one, all over the country, fans are out to play their favorite games. By the end of 1980, 86% of Americans between the ages of 13 and 20 had played an arcade video game. Why? Well, the reasons are as different as the people who play them. Your, your reflexes in action have to be right there to mm -hmm. beat the computer. It's a machine. Yes. And the object is to prove that I'm better than the machine. Yeah. It's, it's a big thrill to get a high score on a game. I just do it for fun. I'm not, I'm not a good enough to get in a tournament. But some of these, you know, kids that are five, six years old that come up and play a machine and just totally demolish the machine. It's just, the, you know, more power to them if they can do it. They tried to shoot you, and then, um, I like it because it just builds up your brain. Then sometimes they shoot you. It's a lot of fun. You gotta do a lot of things. You're actually playing against an electronic brain. And the better you get, the tougher the game will get. According to Frank, beating a game is just about impossible. Uh, video games, for sure, some of them have been conquered. Asteroids have been played for over 50 hours on a single quarter. And I'd have to say that's conquering a machine, all right? Uh, scoring you know, millions and millions of points. That's conquering a machine. But that's the real exception. There's very few people who can sit on any game and play for any length of time. What's your highest score on this machine? Uh, about 65,000. 1,380. That's a million. A million? Yeah. I can't believe that. That's incredible. 105,000. Um, five million by myself. I think my high score in Astro is about 60,000, very poor by today's standards. It's 
especially considering the time that I've uh, invested in it. I think right now my top store is around 35,000. My high score happens to be a little over 150,000. 69,000. 60, 1,500. I just like the play for fun. I don't care about the score. I see you getting real excited while you're watching it. <laughs> I get hungry while I'm watching it. You get hungry while you're watching they think they're having fun. I just fell in love. Uh, we feel that a skillful player can play three to four to five minutes, and on some games, maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And it's that challenge. When you're playing a machine and you get a million, how long do you have to play it to get that kind of score? Uh, about an hour and a half. Hour and a half. Don't you get tired or? No. No? It's fun. Once you hit a million on a machine, then what happens? Well, then it goes crazy, and just everything you hit, you get a free ship and a free smart bomb. Don't you strive to get higher than a million? Well, you do, except then you get sick of it by that time. Real life is, uh, can be uh, uh, not quite as exciting as some of these video games. They're fun. They're challenging. They're something to do on a Saturday afternoon. Video games are all these things, and they have the potential to be a lot more. The incredible sophistication of video games has taken them beyond the arcades right into the U.S. Army. At an Army training center in Virginia, they're using a specially modified version of Atari's Battle Zone to train gunnery officers. It's all part of a whole new language, a universal language that will soon move right into our living rooms. In fact, it already has and Mike Moon, president of Atari's home consumer division, is helping it along. Actually, Missile Command's been one of my favorites. Space Invaders was a favorite. Uh, Asteroids has been a favorite. It's been a very, very good selling game. Probably, if I had my druthers, that's about all I would do all day is play games or spend time with the engineers and develop brand new games. The home market is all family. The home market involves women. Uh, you don't necessarily have as many women in the arcades. You have uh, primarily boys ages uh, 14 up to 16 and 18 in the arcades, whereas in the home market, you definitely pick up mothers, uh, younger children, et cetera, in those markets. I think there's a, there's a certain amount of fantasy. We probably all wanted to be an astronaut at one point in time in our life, but we've all wanted to uh, go into hyperspace, and this gives you the ability to do just that. And because of the electronics involved in games today, uh, it's just as challenging for adults as it is for a child, because we have three or four different skill levels on literally every game that's on the market out there today. My, my wish list, our wish list here at Atari, would, would be speech uh, and would be monitors with better graphics. Uh, so that we could have more players, your games could have more strategy levels. Uh, imagine, if you will, you, you're out there in a field of asteroids, and all of, a something, all of a sudden someone's saying, look out, watch out from behind, watch out from the left, they're coming from the right, that type of thing. Because what that does to the game player is that accelerates the pace, it accelerates the frenzy, and it makes it that much of a better game. In a moment, when we come back, we'll look into our Silicon Valley crystal ball, and we'll try to find out what video games will look like in the very near future. In 10 years, we've gone from this to this, with screens full of exploding star fields, black holes, and hostile galaxies. And it's all because of the incredible ability of today's computers. Drawing instructions are fed into the computer's memory bank using a special TV camera. And then, as if by magic, the computer responds to the programmer's directions 
for color, background, and pattern. Oh, brother. Well, the experts tell us that this is just a beginning. Behind these doors, engineers, programmers, and video fanatics are designing the future. And in a business like this, the future is right down the hall. We anticipate being able to do more advanced things technologically with regard to that 3D concept. Mm -hmm. um, you've noticed that those drawings are line drawings in which we connect from point to point with a line. Mm -hmm. Well, in the future, we would expect to be able to fill in and shade the areas while maintaining the three-dimensional effect that, that you have playing that game. I would like to be able to see the games continue to expand in the, the computer graphics capability, the, uh, the display, the medium, uh, the ability of the player to get involved in the video and the audio of it so that you have sort of an environment you're in. I think that you'll see speech in a very integral part of video games, both in the arcades and in the home environment over the next several years, and that will have a, a new element in gameplay. As far as the next generation of video games, we ourselves do not know. We've got some various ideas that we're limited by technology due to cost uh, parameters, but I think really we're only, our only limitation besides the economics is our imagination. Come. That's all happening tomorrow. But let's get back to the action. You see, they just appointed me as a protector of the valley against the space invaders.